If we talk about the way that the DNA is actually used to ultimately run the cell, this is what we call gene expression. So gene expression is summed up in this picture that you do see here. We have information in the DNA and then that information is gonna go through a couple different molecules and ultimately we will end up with something that's able to perform some type of function inside the cell. So at the top we have our DNA. That DNA is what we call the organism's genotype. This is the actual DNA sequence of the genes. And by DNA sequence, we're talking about the base sequence. That is going to ultimately get copied into a complementary RNA molecule. That is really the instructions for making the protein, but it's gonna be a smaller molecule. It's gonna be a mobile molecule. And then lastly, we're gonna get that turned into a polypeptide and that polypeptide will determine what we call the phenotype of that individual organism. The phenotype is the physical features or functional traits of an organism, and that is really determined by the polypeptides, by the proteins that are there, which obviously does relate back to the DNA sequence, which we have here at the top. So we do wanna know what the difference is between the genotype, it's the DNA sequence of the gene, and then the phenotype, which is the physical features that are resulting from the protein that is made from that same gene. So all of this um, that we described there is what we call the central dogma of genetics. So what this describes is that we start with DNA. DNA is our blueprint, the cell's blueprint, and this is all of that genetic information. That DNA molecule, certain regions of it are going to get copied into RNA molecules and that copying process, taking a portion of the DNA and turning around and making a complementary RNA molecule, that is what we refer to as transcription. And there will be a set of enzymes that are involved in that transcription process. Once we have that RNA molecule, that RNA molecule is the instructions to make the protein. And so there will be this process then called translation, where the information in the RNA is actually translated or converted into a polypeptide or protein sequence. So to sum it up, we have information in DNA. That information in the DNA is copied or transcribed into an RNA molecule. The RNA molecule is then converted or translated into a working functional protein that will then create some type of phenotype inside of a cell. So if we talk about these individual processes, we've got transcription and we've got translation. We'll talk about the transcription one first because that is really the first step that has to take place. So as we talk about transcription, transcription is defined as using DNA to make a complementary RNA copy or complementary RNA molecule. And this is something that's gonna occur wherever the DNA is at because the DNA is the template that we're working from. So if we're talking about prokaryotes, this is gonna happen in the nucleoid region. If we're talking about eukaryotes, this is gonna happen in the nucleus. The steps of translation involve initiation, getting it started, then we'll have elongation, and then we'll actually terminate the process. First step is obviously gonna be initiation, and with initiation, one of the things that has to be done is we have to select the genes to be copied. In other words, we're not going to go through and copy all of the DNA. That's what the process of DNA replication did. But here we're selecting which genes, which regions of the DNA do we actually want to make protein from at this particular moment in time. So if we look here, here this is showing us a double-stranded DNA molecule. This would be just a little portion of a big chromosome. And within this DNA molecule, there is going to be a region of the DNA which is referred to as the promoter. The promoter is DNA sequence that helps the cell determine when to copy the gene. So most genes will have this little promoter region right in front of them. And again, these are instructions. They're basically gonna tell the cell, this is when you want to actually transcribe, copy this particular gene into a piece of RNA. So there will be molecules whose job is to interpret that information. The actual molecule that is going to 
um, bind and produce the copy of RNA is RNA polymerase. So RNA polymerase is the enzyme that makes RNA. It is a little bit of a clumsy enzyme. So as a clumsy enzyme, it needs a little bit of help getting to the right starting place. And that's what the sigma factor right here does. So sigma factor is going to help RNA polymerase bind to the promoter region. And once it's there, it can kind of give it a boot and help it get started making the RNA. So that's the initiation process. After we have the RNA polymerase bound there, the next thing that it has to do is it has to peel open the two strands of DNA. And so you can see this little bubble that forms where we have pulled apart the strands of DNA. And so here it's referred to as unzipping the DNA. Specifically what's happening is that the hydrogen bonds that are holding the two strands together, they're being peeled apart. So they're being broken and RNA polymerase is able to do that, actually peel them apart from each other. And as soon as it does that, it's going to move down the DNA. As it moves, that little bubble moves with it, which means that right behind it, the DNA closes back up again and reforms the double helix. With the elongation process, the RNA polymerase molecule is going to actually do the reading of the DNA template and it's gonna make an RNA molecule from that. And that's what we see right here. The red is representing RNA. So the RNA is gonna be made um, by using the base pairing rules. It's always the base pairing rules. The big difference here is that since it is RNA, we're not gonna have any T's inside and we will have U's instead. But you can see how the RNA polymerase is basically looking at the DNA template, which is blue here. And if it sees an A, it's gonna match up the right nucleotide. So across from an A, it's gonna put a U. Across from a G, it's gonna put a C and so on. And it will continue to go down the DNA strand, making this short piece of RNA as it goes along. Now, if we were to step back and look at what we actually have inside the cell, it is very possible and very common, really, that we have many RNA polymerases that are concurrently transcribing the same gene. What we mean by that is that they are all working to make a copy of RNA at the same time. So initially you have an RNA polymerase that binds the promoter and then it starts to move along as it makes RNA. But as soon as it has vacated the promoter, another one can come along and bind and start moving along and making RNA. So you get a whole bunch of them actually making RNA at the same time here. And as you can see, we can get a lot of RNA really fast. So this would help us in the end to hopefully get a lot of protein really fast. Now, how is RNA polymerase different from DNA polymerase? Well, RNA polymerase, first of all, it is able to unwind the DNA strands and open it right up. So it's able to make that little bubble, peel apart the um, two strands, break the hydrogen bonds. That's not something that DNA polymerase was able to do. With DNA polymerase, we had to have a helicase enzyme that performed that job. Another thing that makes RNA polymerase different is that RNA polymerase does not need that starter molecule. It does not need a primer. Instead, it's able to put the first nucleotide in and just start building from that point forward. RNA polymerase is only going to transcribe one of the DNA strands. It's a double-stranded molecule, but we're peeling it apart, we're reading off of one, and we are in the end making a single-stranded RNA molecule rather than trying to copy and make exact copies of this single huge DNA molecule. Another thing is that RNA polymerase in general is slower. RNA polymerase is obviously making a different product than what DNA polymerase was making. So here it's making RNA, and we have to remember that RNA has a different composition than the DNA had. So RNA nucleotides, they contain ribose, which is a different sugar, and they also have uracil as one of their bases instead of thymine. So RNA polymerase is going to recognize that whenever it sees an A in the DNA, it needs to put a uracil or a U across from that. And then a the last thing here is that RNA polymerase is going to be much less efficient at proofreading. So we will not have the proofreading, the double checking process going on to ensure that we really get an exact copy of the DNA every single time. The last stage of transcription is termination. And termination is just like it sounds. This is when we have finished making the RNA molecule. 
And again, we were really just taking a small portion of the DNA molecule and copying it into RNA. So we start right there next to the promoter, we go along through the elongation process, and at some point we reach what is called the terminator. So the terminator is information in the DNA that specifies this is the stop location. So you think of it as being similar to the promoter, but this is just instructions for stopping. There's two different ways that the termination process probably occurs. Um, we can see both of them here. One of them is called self-termination, and in that case, it's thought that the RNA molecule, shown here in red, begins to loop up and kind of bunch up, and we call these little loops hairpins, and the formation of the hairpin structure just disrupts the overall bonding of the RNA polymerase with the DNA template. And so it kind of bumps and causes the RNA polymerase to let go of the DNA, and then that is the end of transcription. The other method involves a protein called Rho, and this is called Rho dependent termination. And in Rho dependent termination, basically the Rho protein is kind of following along behind the RNA polymerase, and at some point they collide. And when there is this collision, there is this overall letting go of the um, DNA template. So RNA polymerase kind of turns loose of everything. It lets go of the DNA and it also lets go of the RNA molecule that it was synthesizing. So if we sum up the differences between what we had in prokaryotes and what we see with the transcription in eukaryotes, first off, the location where this is gonna take place is gonna be different. So it is specifically in the nucleus when we're talking about eukaryotes. It was nucleoid region in the prokaryotes. Another thing is that the RNA polymerases, they need a lot of help when we're talking about getting started. And not only is this getting started, but actually in the elongation process as well. So these helper proteins are going to be called transcription factors, and then we'll have elongation factors that help with kind of the middle of it, getting through and continuously connecting new nucleotides onto our growing RNA molecule. And then also a last thing in eukaryotes and a very important process in eukaryotes is that the RNA that we get at the end does have to be processed. And by processed, that means that there are additional steps that have to take place to get that into the molecule that later we want to use for the instructions to make the polypeptide. So let's talk a little bit about this overall processing um, of the RNA. We refer to this as post-transcriptional processing. Post-transcriptional because it's after transcription, and this is something that is unique to eukaryotes. So we don't have this happening in the prokaryotes. Well, one of the things that happens is that the five prime end of the RNA molecule is going to get a special addition to it, and this is a modified guanine nucleotide. So this is gonna get added onto what we call the five prime end of the molecule. It looks a little bit different from the typical um, guanine residue that you would have inside of the RNA molecule. We're also going to get an addition on the other side of our RNA molecule, and this is going to be what we call polyadenylation. This is the addition of a whole bunch of adenine residues, so adenine nucleotides. So there's gonna be a bunch of them, and it can range anywhere from 50 of them in a row up to maybe 250, just A, 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 at the three prime end. The third type of processing that takes place is, pro is the third type of processing that takes place is called splicing. Splicing is going to involve cutting and pasting the RNA molecule, and ultimately we will be removing, discarding certain sections that we do call introns, and we will be taking the remainder that we have left and joining that together to make the final RNA molecule. So if we look at a summary of this overall process, at the very top we have our DNA molecule, and that DNA molecule has different regions within it. We have what we call introns, which are non-coding regions, and by non-coding regions, these do not contain the actual instructions that are needed to make the protein or make the polypeptide. And then we have exons, which are the portions that do contain those instructions. With transcription, we copy exactly what was there in the DNA. So we end up with this single-stranded RNA molecule that has some regions that have instructions for making polypeptides, and there are some regions that are not instructions. And so ultimately, we will want to get rid of those. But before we get rid of them, we are gonna put the cap 
on the five prime end, so that's right here. We're gonna get lots of A's over here on this end, so that's the poly A tail. And then the processing that you he see here, this is that splicing that's gonna take place. The complex that does this is called the spliceosome. This is able to recognize where the coding sequence ends and the non-coding sequence begins and it will actually loop it out as you see right here and then it's going to cut so it would cut cut and then it's going to join them together so in the end we end up with what we call an mrna mrna stands for messenger rna this is the instructions that the ribosome ultimately will end up using to make the polypeptide and that's also a molecule that can then be taken from the nucleus and it can be exported because in eukaryotes the protein making part is gonna take place in the cytoplasm.